the door is closing, that means that we are ready to start. I wish you a warm welcome to my second session here at Magdeburger Developer Days. I'm really looking forward to this session. As I mentioned in my first one, after two and a half years doing just virtual events, I'm back on the stage and it feels really great and I'm honored to be part of the Magdeburger Developer Days 2022 again. In the next hour, we will talk about Azure Container Registry, but not about just the basics, what the Azure Container Registry is. You can probably guess from its name. You can store container images in the Azure Container Registry, obviously. Yes, we will store some, some uh, container images in the ACR, but in this talk, I would like to focus on use cases that go beyond simple storage of container images in ACR. Um, I have prepared a bunch of examples, so we will try a lot of things. Um, my, in, the entire source code sample that you will see in this talk is available on this URL, and these are my online slides. So if you would like to have them, um, let me quickly zoom in a little bit. So take out your phone. This is the URL. Uh, I will also record this session and I will put them um, maybe in the next few days on my YouTube channel. So just look for my name, YouTube, you will find all my sessions of this conference on my YouTube channel in a few days. Okay, good. Nice. So back to the slides and let's get started. Some of you might not know me yet, and I think it's a good practice to introduce oneself if we are in a new community. My name is Rainer Stoppik. I come from beautiful Austria, from a small town named Leoning near Linz, which is right in the middle between Vienna and Salzburg, approximately that. So I had to drive quite a long, or, uh, quite a long while to come here to beautiful Magdeburg. I developed software for nearly 30 years, and I still love it. Every day I can write code is a good day. That's a saying that I always repeat. Um, I am an MVP and regional director, which does not mean that I'm on the payroll of Microsoft, not at all. I just do a lot of community work, like this conference, for instance. Besides my work in my own company, which is called Software Architects, I am a trainer. I do a lot of trainings at various companies, at public training locations, and so on. I'm uh, spending one day a week as a teacher in a vocational college uh, in, in my hometown, and I'm a mentor at the Coding Club Flint, which runs a programming club for kids. This is my huge passion, my hobby, my biggest hobby, um, coding with kids. That is, is a lot of fun, and I do that in my spare time. Besides that, I uh, run a meetup, the Rust Links meetup, so if you are interested in Rust, feel free to to join us and, and visit us. By the way, I will use Rust samples in this talk. Don't worry if you've never seen Rust, that's absolutely no problem. I just needed any programming language because we have to build some images from it. And I thought you all are probably C-sharp developers. Maybe I thought so. So it would be quite boring if I show you another session with C-sharp code. I wanted to show you something different, something that I love very much. So I decided to go for Rust for today. But don't worry, again, if you don't know Rust, no problem. You will definitely understand the code. It will not be a deep dive in Rust. Now, for those of you who are new to ACR, let me spend only a few minutes, recap the basics of ACR so you know what this stuff is all about, okay? What's ACR and why would you need it? ACR is a managed Docker registry service. ACR stands for Azure Container Registry, and it's essentially a managed instance of the open source Docker Registry 2.0. You might be familiar with the Docker Hub. This is the public version of the Docker Registry. And the ACR is essentially your private version of the Docker Hub. And it's running in Azure. It can run in all the data centers in Microsoft Azure. It supports the open container uh, image format uh, specification and the OCI distribution specification. That means you cannot only store container images, but you can store your Helm charts in it. You can store WebAssembly um, in it, just like I showed in the previous talk, for instance. So you can store a lot of things in it. It doesn't matter which format you use. This is not relevant for this talk. Here we will focus on something else, but I thought it would be interesting to, to know. So why would you need an ACR? Well, one thing is that the Docker Hub 
has um, download rate limits. You might be aware of them, maybe you are not, it depends. Um, if you run your own container registry, you don't have those limits at all because this container registry belongs to yourself. That's the first thing. But the second thing, and this is even more important, the ACR allows you to network close store your container image to your deployment. So if you want to deploy your apps, for instance, in Microsoft Azure Western Europe, that's a data center near Amsterdam, for instance, then it would be nice if the containers are, or the container images are already stored from a network perspective right beside your deployment location. And that is exactly what ACR can do. You can put your ACR right beside your deployments and with that, speed up deployments and things like that. You can also geo-replicate your ACRs so you can push your container images, for instance, to Western Europe and Azure will use Microsoft's worldwide network to replicate your container image to Asia or to the US or wherever. So if you, for instance, are a publisher of container images and you want to make sure that your Asian customers have a good download experience, then you can geo-replicate to Microsoft Azure Asia and you don't have to deal with it. It's done automatically by Microsoft, okay? The next thing is very important in an enterprise scenario. Many enterprises have rather strict corporate governance rules. Corporate governance means that you cannot just run everything in the plain internet. You have to secure it properly. You have to have resource-based access control so that only those people who should be able to access a container image are able to access it protected by the underlying uh, system. And that is exactly what ACR does. It's tightly integrated into Azure Active Directory, so you can use your corporate accounts Azure Active Directory to protect access to ACR. And for enterprises, that is huge. That is really, really important. However, if you want to, um, to, to offer container images for public download, for instance, if you are an open source company, for instance, an organization publishing open source container images, you can definitely do so. You can enable the ACR to offer anonymous downloads. So it's really up to you. Do you want to have a protected version or do you want to have a public version? You can do it. Last thing, you have a lot of advanced security features. I will not go into very much details. You can do uh, code signing, uh, co yeah, you can do image tag signing, that's the correct um, word here. You can have VNet integration. Many of my enterprise customers, they are not allowed to run uh, platform as a service offerings in the public internet. They are forced to limit access to certain virtual networks because of security reasons. And this is pretty easy if you're using an ACR. You can run your container registry in Azure it will be managed by Microsoft, but you have it integrated into your VNet and therefore only your employees, your systems, your deployments can access these ACRs. And as I mentioned, in enterprises, governance is a big thing in the cloud and therefore super important. Yes, you have Defender support for image scanning and things like that, but as I, saw, as I told you, this is not the core topic of this talk, so let's continue. The last thing, is the thing which is the most important thing for the rest of this talk. You can use ACR with so-called tasks as a CI-CD platform. And many people don't know about that. ACR is a complete CI-CD solution. You can compile your code there, you can test your code there, you can deploy these images, you can trigger deployments in Kubernetes, in app services, in container instances, whatever you want to do. You might ask yourself now, why should I? It's nice that I can, but why should I? I can use GitHub, I can use Azure DevOps pipelines, whatever. Why do I need a third CI CD platform? Well, keep this thought, and I will try to answer it at the very end of this talk, because on the one hand side, I don't want you to leave now. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, I need to show you some possibilities and then you will understand why ACR, why it makes sense to have a CI CD platform built purely on container technology. So this is what the, the rest of the talk will be about. So let me quickly give you a 
short demo. So if you haven't seen ACR yet, let me go to the portal. I hope that internet will stay active. So maybe we'll wait one or two times. Here we are. This is the Azure Container Registry. I will zoom in, give me a sec. This is the Azure Container Registry that I'm going to use throughout this talk. And you see, you have identity and access management, access control. This is what I meant with AAD integration. Um, you have various things like, for instance, the network integration, where you can say this should be in a VNet. You have managed identity support, which is important. And here we find all our repositories. For instance, here, see it here, I have imported the Linux Alpine base image into my container registry. This is just a clone from the Alpine image from Docker Hub. This is how it looks like. Be below the repositories, we have all the tags, as you can see it here. And I can click on one of the tags, and here you see the details about this image in the ACR. Okay, that's just storing images. Do we have anything else? Uh, yeah, we have some things, but they are out of scope of this talk because I only have one hour, so I have to uh, I have to really focus on the things that I'm going to show you. First thing, webhooks. Webhooks will not be a difficult thing, but I want to. I have a plan. Just, just trust me, okay? Webhooks will be pretty simple. What webhooks does with ACR is pretty obvious. If something happens in the ACR, we send a webhook to somebody else. Yeah. But I want to show you how that works, and we will see that this webhook feature is crucial for the rest of ACR tasks to work, okay? So let's take a look. I have built a small little example, and let me quickly introduce you to this example. I will sneak in a little bit of tiny information about Rust, and maybe you get curious about it. That's by design, but yeah, don't worry. Um, it, it, it is like it is. You see? Uh, this is how you write applications with uh, web APIs in Rust. Rust has a lot of different uh, API development platforms. This is a platform which is called da -da 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 -da, here Rocket. So this API has been built with Rocket, and you can probably guess from the context what this is. This is a function listening to a certain route and returning a string as a result. And if I scroll down a little bit, you can probably guess from the context what this might be. This is a function that listens to this route and renders a template, in this case, a handlebar template, very similar to razor pages, right? And yeah, something like this. And down here, you are simply launching the web server. And as you can see here, you can write unit tests or integration tests, very similar to ASP.NET Core, right? And what I have done here is for, for this application, um, I have, let's run it, I have built a small uh, request bin. Have you ever heard from request bins? You can send any post request that you like, and it will gather these post requests, and later you can see a kind of protocol what has been done with your, with your API. Let me show you what I built here. I have here a simple request. I can call the ping method. It should return pong. It does it. I have created a king method. Guess what it returns? Pong. And I can send a post request to this bin. OK, your request has been collected, is written here. And then I can go to, let me show, requests. And here we are. And here you see what we have done. Oh, that was, that was not a good idea. I rebuilt it. So let me send another ping here. That is good. And refresh it. And here you see. The details, I can take a look at the headers and so on. Yeah, works as expected. Everything is fine. I also published this code onto Azure. As you can see here, I took this image and I published it to azurewebsites.net, right? So if I send um, a, a post request there, you see it here, then I can take a look at the body. I can take a look at the header. It just runs in Azure and we will try that. We will use this request bin to set up webhooks for ACR, and when we push something onto ACR, we should see the result in the webhooks, right? Because ACR will send a post request, that is what a webhook is all about, to 
any other system that we like. Let me show you how we set it up. First, clear this list, go here, and we can, if we want, go here to webhooks. And as you can see, I already have set up the webhook for you here. And I can hit the configure button. And as you can see here, I said, hey, set up this webhook, send requests to this URL. This is my URL written in Rust that you have seen a second ago. And it will simply send these requests. I can tailor the actions that should trigger webhooks just as I like. This would be publishing of a new container image. This would be deleting one, and I think you get the idea. This chart thing, this is Helm, okay? I don't know if you are familiar with Helm. If you are, then you know what I mean. If you are not familiar with Helm, that is something that you can write down, and maybe it will be interesting for you. Essentially, it's a kind of package manager for larger applications consisting of multiple container images. Okay, something like npm install, but for container images. Now, that's Helm, okay? And the status is on, and in scope, I could filter. I could filter the webhooks that I would like to publish. So, let's try that uh, with the webhook thing. I have written down some notes. Okay, here they are. And I can take this thing and push something. Let me see where it is. Yeah, here it is. The first thing that I would like to do, let me stop this one so I can copy out some code, is I will pull the latest version of Alpine. Zip, so can you see something large enough? Okay, okay. Let's pull down the latest version of Alpine. It should be pretty fast because I already prepared it. It should be cached on my machine. Yes, here it is. So if you are not that familiar with uh, ACR and you don't know what this thing is all about, the next line is super important for you. I will zoom in. Here we are. Come on. Here we are. Run it. Please take a look at this line here. As you can see here, I'm, I'm adding a tag to my container image. I'm saying the Alpine latest container image should now be known also as ACR beyond images .azure -cr .io slash alpine slash latest. I'm just adding a tag where, let's take another color here, this one is the name of the registry, which is my ACR, right? Now I can take this thing and simply push it. I can take this thing and because of the first part of the name, Docker knows that it has to push not to the Docker hub, but it has to push to Azure container registry. It was pretty fast because I've done it before. It would have taken quite a while on the conference Wi-Fi, but now it just recognized that it's already there. Everything is good. And if I know, if the demo gods are smiling, I can go here, refresh this thing, and see, this is what I wanted to show you. As you can see here, we got uh, a post request from ACR onto our request bin. And I can show you the body to prove the point. And if I scroll to the right, you will at one point see that we have pushed the Alpine latest image onto our container registry. And now use your imagination. What does that mean? This webhook could, for instance, go to Azure App Service and trigger a deployment of your app onto Azure App Service. This thing could send a, a webhook to some internal CI CD systems, to GitHub, to GitHub Actions, to Azure DevOps, to whatever you want to do. It could send a webhook to your Kubernetes cluster to trigger some deployments. So webhooks are really great. They are the first step to running automated processes whenever something happens in your container registry. Docker Hub can do that too, granted, but we will see that this is just the first step in Azure for a larger task system, okay? so. You have now seen first our sample, which is a little bit of Rust code. It wasn't, it didn't hurt, right? Also for C sharp developers. And the second thing, you have seen that webhooks are really a good thing, and they are super, super useful. You can do also nice things here. You have in the Azure portal a list of webhook calls. You can directly ping the webhook, and you will see that the webhook is on and fine, and everything is good. You can take a look at the details here. You see, we sent something to the request bin. Everything is good. 
Everything is fine. Webhooks, check. This was just for getting warm, for warming up. And now comes the more interesting stuff. This was the demo. Let me click on this button. Yes, now we are going to build images. And we are going to build them first locally and then, of course, in the cloud. Let me do a quick recap because I'm pretty sure that not everybody in the audience is deep, deep, deep into Docker. Maybe you are, then it will be a quick recap and you will feel comfortable because you think, okay, I know all this stuff, I'm a pro. But maybe other people are no professionals and you would like to have a quick recap about what Docker files, especially multi-step Docker files, are all about because that is important for the rest of the talk. Let me show you the Docker file of this small, little, tiny, teeny application. I can zoom in a little bit more, and I think that should be okay. So let me zoom in so you see it a little bit there, better. This, what you see here, is called a multi-stage Docker file. Multi-stage means that we have not a single from statement in Docker, but we have multiple of these from statements, you see? Every from statement is a stage. Now the first stage, is taking the Rust Alpine base image, which contains the Rust compiler. Microsoft offers a similar base image, like um, .NET SDK. The SDK image is the base image for, contain, for compilers, for the C-sharp compiler. And what we do here is we are using the Alpine version of the Rust compiler to have a rather small and, and very performant uh, base image for building Rust applications. Again, for C-sharp, that would be the Microsoft C-sharp base image. For Java, this would be something else. If you are a Java developer, you know what to take. Here, I'm just adding one package, package that I must add in order to be able to build a Rust application on, um, on, on Alpine. The next one is now taking this builder base, you see this one, and uses the first stage as its base. Here, I'm copying the source code of my app, and I'm triggering the build process of my Rust app. In .NET, you would say .NET build. Now, cargo is what .NET XE is for .NET. See, cargo build release, you can probably guess from the context what this stuff really does. But now it's get really interesting, because if you take a look here, here we have something strange. You see, we have a stage which I called tests. It also is based on the builder image that we had before, and it's using cargo test. Again, I guess you can guess from the context what this does. It's the same as .NET test, right? I'm compiling in a release version, and then I'm running the integration tests. This is what I do here. This is cargo test. So interesting. I have a stage in my Docker file to run unit tests. Sounds like CI, CD, right? I will show you how I make use of that later on. And last but not least, this is the production image. In contrast to ASP.NET Core, Rust builds a self-contained executable. So you do not need some .NET installed or whatever. You get a binary and you can run it if you want, even directly on top of the Linux kernel. You have no dependencies at all. So in this case, I decided to go for brand, for, for the, for a stripped down Alpine version with nothing else in it, I copy my executables, my handlebar templates, and a small uh, web server configuration file, which is called Rocket Totama. I copy them from the builder image, and I say, hey, if this thing starts, start this executable, okay? So no binary prerequisites for Rust. I, I, I love this about Rust. I am not the biggest fan of node modules, I am not the biggest fan of 250 DLLs for a very simple web application. Are you? I'm not sure. I love Go and Rust for the property that they simply build a single executor and you can run it. I love that. It's like AOT compilation that is coming for C Sharp 2, right? Okay. Nice. This looks good. Let's try it. Okay. Stop that one. Um, I have built a just file. Just files are super useful. Um, I, I mentioned in my previous task, let me quickly show you what just is all about. Do you know make? 
the make tool. I see some nodding heads. Maybe you, maybe you know, maybe you don't. Um, this is just like make, but in a modern way. Just, just files allow you to define targets and allow you to define a, a shell, shell script if you want. Um, they can call each other, as you can see it here. They can have parameters and all this stuff. And if I, for instance, would like to run my app, I can simply say, just run, pun intended, and it runs. See? Or I can say, just watch, and hey, just watch, it's running. It really works, and I, if I change something, it will automatically rebuild everything. Just, it's really a nice tool. It's not limited to, to Rust. You can use it for any programming language that you like. Whenever you have to automate some tasks, you can simply throw in a just file, and with the tool, just, you can simply run it. I really like it. I also use it in some, uh, in some C Sharp applications, for instance, when I have to automate tasks across an Angular front-end with .NET back-end, and I have to do various things after each other, depending on each other. I often use it. I really like it. Okay, so this was simple. I can run it locally, I can build it locally, and obviously I can test it. Just test. It runs, and hopefully we'll get a green check. We'll see. Building, building, building should only take a few seconds. My laptop is not the fastest one, but it was okay. See. I only wrote a single demo test. It makes sense to test, but it's just one because it's a, it's a demo app. Okay, I think you got it. Now, let's build these things locally. Here, you see, this is my build image task. And note what I'm doing here. I'm run, I run Docker build with a specific target. See that one? I run this thing with a specific target. Let me comment that out because we, ah, let me remove it essentially because I don't need it. So let's try it and let's just build image. This runs locally, nothing special here. And you see, it's running and it will take a while. You see, Rust is just like AOT compilation in C Sharp, not the fastest compiler on earth. My laptop. Uh, this is my travel laptop, so it's not very fast. At home, I have a powerful desktop machine, which is capable of compiling this thing in under two minutes. Still a lot of time for just compiling a rather small application, but try to .NET AOT compile a non-trivial ESP.NET Core application, and you will see it also takes a while. Yeah, if, I don't know if you have tried it, but this takes a while. Still, I can do it, it works, and believe me, it will really work. But the important thing is here, target production. If I take a look here, it will take this production thing. This is based on Alpine, but copy something from the builder. See? So it goes back and looks up the builder. The builder is based on builder base, so it looks up this one, and now we have the full, um, the, the full uh, chain of dependencies between the different uh, stages in our Docker file. Right? Good. That works nice. We can do that uh, locally, and now we will think about what we can do with ACR. Enter quick tasks. Imagine the following situation. You have this application set up, everything is here, you have your Docker file, and in your company you are allowed to bring your own device. Bring your own device is super important. I can bring my, I don't know, iPad or whatever gaming laptop that I like, and I would like to to build this stuff, but I don't have Docker installed. I don't have Rust installed. I don't have Just installed. I simply don't have these prerequisites. Wouldn't it be nice if I could just say, Docker run, but not on my, sh my machine, but somewhere else? Well, you can now pick up the phone, call your IT guys, and say, hey guys, can you please set up a virtual machine for me, install a Docker daemon, so I can use this remote Docker daemon to build my images? Okay wait for two months until they have time to even pick up the phone, and then you might get your virtual machine. After two days, you call them and say, hey, could you please update the Docker daemon because it was a critical security flaw, and they will say, okay, wait for two months, then we will install it. You know the drill, yeah? I'm, yes, I know it doesn't happen in your companies, but when I am at customer sites, I often see companies, believe it or not, that work exactly like that. Wouldn't it be nice to have a Docker daemon sitting somewhere in the cloud, managed magically by somebody else, Microsoft, 
and simply let them do the hard work. And that is exactly what quick tasks are about. And that is exactly what ACR tasks are about. So what you can essentially do, and I already did it here in the just file, you can simply exchange the Docker build statement with ACACR build, see? And that's it. You're done. Azure, Azure Container Registry will do all the heavy lifting. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Docker, uh, uh, with, with, with how Docker does remote building. There is a so-called build context. So what Docker essentially does, it's taking by default the, the local uh, folder where your Docker file is in, takes everything together, ignores all the files that are inside of the .docker ignore file, puts it up into a tarball, sends it to the Docker daemon, and the Docker daemon that does the building. And that is exactly what's happening with ACR. So you take the whole, the, the whole source code, in my case, the Rust source code, put it into a tarball, throw it to Microsoft, to my ACR, in the data center that I selected, I am in charge of selecting where this stuff is compiled, so data sovereignty is not an issue here, and they will run it there. And do you know how you pay for it? You pay for it by second, by execution second. That's serverless at its best. No VM, no reserved capacity, whatever you want, you can do and as many ACACR builds as you want, even simultaneously across your whole team, and you will simply pay what you really use. That's nice, right? Okay, let me show you that this really works. Um, first, let me get rid of this agent pool here. We will talk about that in a second. And yeah, it still runs. Don't worry. We'll take another terminal here and use this. Oh, my screen is too small. Yeah, this is it. Build image ACR cloud. Just build image ACR cloud. Make it large, and let's see. See, uploading archived source code. This is the build context that was uploaded. Now it was waiting for an agent, and believe it or not, the outputs that are here, they are running in the Azure Cloud. Let me show you that. I go to the portal, here it is. This is my Azure Container Registry, and we can go to Tasks, and here I can go to Runs, and here it is running, see? This is a quick task, it's running, and if we want, we can take a look at the logs, and these are exactly the logs that we saw on my local computer. So I really just exchanged Docker build with Azure Ace, with AZ ACR, and that's it. Everything else runs in the cloud. These are so-called quick tasks. They take the source code from your local computer, package it up in a tarball, throw the tarball at your ACR, and it will do all the heavy lifting. Good? Good. This is just a question. Uh, give me a sec. Let me quickly check. I told you all these things. Um, this one is important. Um, the resulting image is automatically pushed to your ACR. So that means you do not need the upload bandwidth to upload maybe a huge container image. I heard that not everybody uses Rust, and I heard that for some programming languages, Docker images can become a teeny tiny bit of large. I mean hundreds of megabytes or even gigabytes. Yeah? Uh, this image that we built here is below 15 megabytes, something like this. So it's really small, it's not a problem, but this thing is really an issue if you have larger container images. And if you build it in the cloud, you just have to upload the source code and the resulting image is, pu is pushed directly inside of ACR. I didn't forget your question, I will come to it in a second. If you take a look at the, the code here, uh, let me put that one here. Uh, you always have to specify the registry here, see? If you are tired of always specifying the registry, and if you only have one, your company registry, you can use, that's a trick, AC config set defaults ACR, so you never have to specify the registry again. You just have to remember, instead of Docker, I write AZ ACR, done. Everything else will run exactly like you have it today. 
Now, uh, yeah, some, some source code here, of course. I already had the demo um, to your question. Um, so, here it is. Da, 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 da. I, will go, oops. I will go back here, but first let me answer your question. Here it is. This is what you can build. Fine for you? Good. So you can run tasks on Windows, on Linux, and on various uh, processor architectures. So let's go back to the slides and quickly recap what we had before. Back, 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 back. Did I forget anything here? No. This is just the slide where you see Docker is dropped and ACACR is inserted. I think you got the idea. Okay, so why should you do that? Let's quickly uh, um, recap that. The first one I didn't mention so far, but it's a huge thing. I don't know why, but in most companies, security is, when it comes to security, people only think about firewalls. When I do discussions with, with, with chief security information officers, they talk firewall and firewall and vnets and firewall and vnets and firewall and vnets. They don't care where the code is built. Even in some large organizations, I see people building production software on developer machines. Partly, especially now during Corona, during COVID crisis, on developer machines which stand at home. In the evening, the young girl or the young boy is playing Minecraft on these things. And then during night, the, the mom or dad are building the production software of the super critical whatever system on the same machine. And then they push it to somewhere and it runs in the holy data center protected by firewalls. It doesn't really make sense, right? And the same is true with Docker demons. Where do developers build Docker images? Many developers. Even in enterprises, build Docker images on their local development machines. And nobody really cares what's installed on these machines. If you don't de deploy it locally, you have your IT guy set up a Docker daemon for you. Who patches that Docker daemon? Do you think they stand up in the middle of the night when there is a critical security flaw to patch your Docker daemon that you use to build your images? They typically don't. Now the ACACR tasks are running in a very tightly secured environment inside the Microsoft data center. Microsoft is using this infrastructure to build their own, their own platform, and therefore it's really tightly secured. It's a good thing that nobody outside of a very, very small group of highly trained and highly trusted system administrators can access these build servers. They are locked down to the most possible extent, and that is a good thing. So these cloud servers, in my opinion, are more trustworthy than a dev machine. First thing, I also already said bring your own device. That's a huge thing, of course. Network distance, I told you. Pulling base images takes a while. Pushing resulting images takes a while. I don't need that if I do ACACR. And maybe I have to build for processor architectures or operating systems that I don't have. I happen to have Windows subsystem for Linux, so I can easily build for Linux and Windows. But maybe I'm a pure Linux user. I don't have Windows. I'm a pure Windows user. I don't have Linux. I think you get the point, right? These are really good things why I could say I want to do quick tasks. Another important thing, which is currently in preview, and I hope that it will reach production um, at one point in the future, or at, near, at a near point in the future, is agent pools. What does that mean? Let me show you that. I created, for demo purposes, an agent pool I called it my agent pool because I didn't come up with a better name. Um, it is a pretty large one. I think it has eight processors and 16 gig of RAM because I just run it for today and then I will drop it again. I can scale it, see here, I can update the count. But the point is, if I do that, I do no longer pay per build minute. But I simply pay the time that these machines are reserved. That's like living in a hotel. I came here yesterday and I had a hotel room reserved to me. If I wouldn't come, they still would charge me the night, even if I don't use it. That is exactly what an agent pool is. You could think of, okay, I need an agent pool to have reserved compute power. Yes, that is one thing. But what is even more important is that this agent pools can be situated in your VNets. 
So what you can do is you can build a VNet in Azure. You can connect it through a VPN gateway with your local data center. And then suddenly your build agents in ACR are capable of accessing, for instance, databases or servers running in your on-prem data center. You can isolate these build agents fully from the public internet. They are running locally in your VNet. So VNet support is built in. Great thing. Many enterprises that I work with struggle with this topic. They need to limit public internet access to their systems. And this is exactly what you can do here. So what is the difference? What do we have to do if we want to run our quick task, not in the, in the public pool, but in my pool, the only thing that you have to do is you have to specify the agent pool, and then it's using the agent pool. That's it. It's as easy as that. Okay? Got it? Makes sense, right? Good. So these agent pools are VMs, granted, but they are not managed by your IT guys. They are managed by Microsoft. So you never see the VM. You cannot connect to this VM. You cannot install additional software on this VM. You don't manage it at all. It's not patched by you. It's an updated by you. It's run by Microsoft. No updating, no patching. It's just a, an entity that you can position in your VNet and you can, uh, you can get guaranteed compute resources if you want to make absolute sure that you have the compute resources that you need when you need it. Because everything else is like time sharing, like reserving a hotel room at last minute. What happens if Microsoft don't have any resources left? Then the step waiting for a free agent can take a while. If you don't want that, you can reserve it. And you get the idea. It's currently in preview. That means, to your question, sir, unfortunately currently only Linux, and it's not available everywhere. So please check the documentation. I added a documentation link here. Please check the documentation um, if you want to uh, get details about these agent pools. Um, yeah, reasons we already discussed that. That was the agent pools. So let's check whether this worked. Yeah, see? Ha ha, it was successful. It took nine minutes, but it was successful. That's okay. Yeah, that's okay. That's still not perfect, and that's a little bit of a drawback of AC ACR build. I told you that on my desktop computer at home, this is much faster. I have a pretty strong CPU, I have a lot of RAM, I have very fast SSDs, I can build everything locally, so it takes under two minutes to build this on my local dev machine. But still, I can do that for development purposes, and then I check in the code, and really, I don't care if this runs in the background and takes five times the time. It, it, I really don't care. Okay, good. Next one. Multi-step ACR tasks. I love this GIF. I, I didn't find a better one for multi-step ACR tasks. We already discussed multi-stage Docker files. And now, on top of multi-stage Docker files, we have multi-step ACR tasks. Isn't that beautiful? Now, what is this stuff all about? I have to show you the sample, and then you can immediately guess from the context what this stuff is all about. This is a multi-step ACR task file. Essentially, it's a, another WAML file. Isn't that beautiful? You have so many WAML files nowadays. You have GitHub Actions, WAML files, Azure DevOps, WAML files, and now I have a third WAML file to control your CI CD processes. Nice, isn't it? It is like it is. Don't kill the messenger. I'm just telling you what, what this stuff is all about. Now, the good thing is that these WAML files only support exactly three types of steps. They support a build step, which is essentially Docker build. They support a push step, which is essentially Docker push. And they support a CMD step, which is essentially a Docker run step. So let's take a look at these three steps. The first step says, build target production. This will be the image that I use for running my request bin sample. This one targets the builder 
It's running. Let me show you the Docker file. It's building this, oh sorry, this one. So it's just building the builder image. But wait a minute. The production is built on top of the builder image. So therefore, this step will be brutally fast because it's cached. But we simply build something and we call it, as you can see here, request bin tests. I only add this one to essentially add another, tar another tag to this specific image because in the next step, I use it, exactly that one, to run my tests. See? So I build the production image. I build a separate image that contains my build app and my build tests. And then I run the unit tests. So this is really building, testing, and at the end, deploying. And what does this deploy trigger? A webhook. What does the webhook do in reality? It sends something to your Kubernetes cluster or to your Azure App Service. So the next step through the magic of the webhook will be the deployment of the new version of your app. And suddenly, you have a closed loop. You can run it, you can, run, uh, you can build it, you can run the test, you push it, push it, webhook, webhook, deploy, and we are good. Understand? Now, how can I run this guy? Well, if I want to run this guy, I need it to be in a Git repo. It needs to be in GitHub, or it needs to be in Azure DevOps. That's important. So if we take a look at the just file, here it is. I prepared that for you, and it is, it is exactly here. Let me show you that one, this one. Please note especially this file, this, this line down here. It says, hey, here you find the source code, and this is the task file. So what it does, I don't have to send the source code anymore, but I just, just point to a Git repo, and by the way, this can be a private Git repo, of course, and I tell it where the file is that controls my, my, my whole task. And if I run this step, this is still a quick task, but it runs everything built on this multi-step WAML file. And the big advantage is that the source code is now very clearly defined to come from GitHub or Azure DevOps. Another level of security, because then you can say, okay, this image was built on exactly that git commit hash. If you run it on a development machine, hey, I can quickly change the source code before I do the build. I don't tell anybody what I changed, and you think that it is this version, but I never checked it in. And suddenly, I have a nice little security flaw in my software. You get the idea, right? So this is exactly what I can do with that. And let me quickly look up a run that I did where you see that one. I think it was that one. Let me see if I'm right. Yes. If we take a look at the, um, at the, the log, I prepared that before because it takes a few minutes. Here you see this is step zero. That will build my application. So this will build the final application. So if I scroll down, you see the downloaded stuff and the compiling stuff. This is all Rust magic going on. And then, and then, and then, and then, where is it? Let me see. Where is my finished? Here it is. Here, we have successfully executed the first step. So I created a new latest version of request bin. Then I'm going on to step one. Now, step one is, as you can see, using the cache. Because these, these caches were automatically filled by the first step. So what you can see here is that all the different task steps are run on the, on the same Docker daemon. So you are using caches. That is important. But the most important thing is this one, the step two. See? I'm running the unit tests. Nice, isn't it? And at the end, I push everything because only if the unit tests are okay, I'm allowed to push everything. And that is uh, here, blah, 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 blah. Where is step three? Uh, yeah, you see, it was successfully pushed. Yeah. I think you get the idea. So this is multi-step 
um, multi-step task files. Yes, you can use custom volumes. Yes, you can use custom networks, just like with, with Docker Compose, a little bit like with Docker Compose. Okay? Good. Nice. Did I miss anything? I don't think so. You have the links, and we're good. Last step, we have eight minutes left, and we are perfectly in time. Wouldn't it be nice to auto-trigger such a task whenever I check something in GitHub? Webhooks. Webhooks is again the solution for exactly that problem. So what we can essentially do is we can, oops, we can create so-called tasks. I'm not sure if I wrote that down. No, I just added the link here, but I did it for you. Here you can see, this is a task, see? And this task goes to my GitHub repo and says to the GitHub repo, hey, whenever somebody pushes something to the GitHub repo, run this task file. And now we have continuous integration. Check in something in GitHub, run the tasks, run the tests, push it to the container registry, fire up a webhook, send it to app service, deploy everything, and we have a closed loop. This is this one. Source, trigger, enabled. But there is something here, and there is something here, and especially this one is the most important and exciting thing about all the thing that I told you in the last hour. Let me show you what this is. Base image trigger. That really solves a pain. How do you ensure in your company that your entire system is rebuilt if a new base image of, let's say, Debian Linux is published because of a security flaw in Debian? Do you stand up at 2 o'clock in the morning, run everything? Of course not. You don't. But ACR has you covered. ACR recognizes the dependencies in your Docker files. And ACR will auto-run the tasks, not just when you check something in GitHub, but it will auto-run all the tasks when any of the base images change. This can be a public base image in Docker Hub. This can be a public base image in Microsoft's ACRs, like .NET. New version of the ASP.NET base image comes out. You need to rebuild everything on your machines. This has you covered. And it also works in your own ACR. So if you have your own base images standardized across your enterprise IT department, then this checks automatically if your, let's say, operating system DevOps team publishes a new base image that is the standard image for all your ASP.NET apps. For whatever reason, you have something customized. This will run the build automatically. I don't have a sample for that because I don't have any more time, but I think you got the idea. I showed it to you, and I can show you a run that I triggered before. This is exactly such a run, you see? This was triggered by a commit in GitHub. I did that right before the session when I set out in the beautiful sunshine, and I checked something in, and magically everything worked. Okay? So let's get back to the slides. Manually triggered, or source code updates, or base image updates, and I told you this is the important one. And schedule. You can also define a time schedule and it will run these tasks automatically for you. Yeah, that's, that is what it can do. I already showed you the temp. Ah, here, here is the code that I was looking for. This is essentially how you create a task. You, told, you tell it which ACR, what is the name of the task, what is the name of the image that you want to build, where is the source code context. In my case, it's GitHub. What is the name of the, in this case, I just used the Docker file. What is the name of the Docker file? And what is the GitHub personal access token, the path? I use this path, or ACR uses this path to set up a webhook for GitHub. This is why it needs a personal access token. Exactly. You might think, okay, this sounds great. How much does it cost? Well, here it is. I'm not talking about the pricing for size of images or whatever, but you've seen that the build of my Rust application takes approximately eight, nine minutes, something like this. How much does it cost? 
Well, um, in this case, the build, if, I, if it would take 10 minutes, that would be 600 seconds, and that would cost 6 euro cent. So you get an idea how much you pay if you just use pay as you go. This is not an agent pool. This is just as it is uh, for pay as you go. So it's not super expensive. Of course, if you have a thousand developers and everybody is building like crazy, you will probably have to pay a little bit, but that's okay for a thousand developers. You get the idea. Okay, so, so it's not super expensive. It's not free either, but it's okay. It's really okay. If you put the amount of work into, um, uh, if you consider the amount of work that your IT guys are saving because they, not have, they don't have to maintain a Docker daemon for building your images, then this is really cheap, really a good pricing point. Okay, so summary, ACR, that is what I wanted to show you, is way more than just a place to store your container images. It can cover a lot of things, including CI, CD, and we have a lot of advantages. It's purely based on container technology, so I don't need any additional systems like GitHub Actions or Azure DevOps pipelines. So if you want to build CI, CD purely on Docker basis, for instance, you can do that. You don't need anything else. Standardized, no ops, the, the, uh, build environment. You don't have to uh, update and patch anything. No Tamagotchis out in the cloud that you have to pet and feed and otherwise they die. Um, it's auto-triggered, especially with base images, base image updates. And that is, are, I think, three pretty compelling arguments. And it is the reason why I suggested this talk. And I'm very grateful that you took an hour to listen to me. And I hope it was interesting. And you've now seen features from Azure that you didn't know before. If you, again, want to take a look at the source code, uh, I showed you the slides before. I will show you the slides again. Here they are. This is the URL. So if you want to take a look at them, maybe at home, and if, you, uh, if, if they contain the link to the source code. And I've also uh, recorded this session. So if recording technology was working, you will find this session on my YouTube channel in the next two days. Okay? Do you have any questions before we go into the break? You can ask them in German too. That's absolutely no problem. I will answer in Austrian. I don't know if you understand me, but I'll try. Okay. You know what? I'm at the end, and I don't want to overrun. Let's close it here, and you can grab me on the hallway or outside in this beautiful weather if you have any questions, and I'm more than happy to answer these questions for you. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of Marketbooker Developer Days. Thank you.